Well, some 600 million cities allocation from government are small loans for micro, small and medium scale businesses. In these difficult times, it's to be disbursed beginning May. Now, that's good news, but who gets what? What is the criteria to be used for the disbursement of the 600 million? Also, the president, Anadokwe Kofado, admits that the decision to lift the lockdown uh, just beginning today will have implications, most of which will be economic. He gave details during a meeting with the Ghana Medical Association earlier today. The meeting ended not too long ago, but just take a listen briefly to what the president explained to uh, the Ghana Medical Association at that meeting at the Jubilee House. At the end of the day, the decision has many, many, many ramifications. Economic, social, cultural, as well, of course, as its health dimensions. And what we are required to do as the decision makers is to balance all these factors and then come to an array, a conclusion and a set of decisions. Clearly, the president admits that there will be economic, you know, indications or consequences to this and really largely there are many who say that the reason for lifting this lockdown is largely economic we ask what outcome will justify the balancing effects that the president was talking about uh what you just heard welcome to your most authoritative business analysis program here on tv3 this is business focus my name is alfred akansi you out there, our cherished viewers, I encourage to also share your views, your comments with us uh, as we have this virtual conversation. My guests are all going to be joining me via Skype. When you're watching us, well, you can share your views, your comments, your opinions. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Now, first, let's take a look at some of the stories that made headlines in the world of business. Well, so that was some of the stories that made headlines in the world of business. You can find more on 3news.com very shortly. We're going to go on to Skype and join my guests uh, who will be talking to us a lot more about their views uh, and opinions. But President Kufado had earlier announced that 600 million city soft loan scheme with a two-year repayment. But before we get into that, let's take a listen to that decision to lift the lockdown uh, on that president's uh, decision and also how that indeed would impact on businesses. Let's take a listen to the president yesterday addressing the press and also explaining the decision to lift the lockdown and what businesses should do now that the lockdown has been lifted. At the end of the day, the decision has many, many, many ramifications. Economic, social, cultural, as well, of course, as its health dimensions. And what we are required to do as the decision makers is to balance all these factors and then come to an array, a conclusion and a set of decisions that will best protect our people and, of course, protect the economy of our country. And at the end of the day, too, I, as president of this country, I cannot ignore also the impact that this lockdown is having on several constituencies of our nation, especially those who we know are 
very important part of the Ghanaian equation, the people who live, if you like, hand to mouth, informal workers who need to have a day out in the market in one form or another to be able to provide for their families and who are having a lot of difficulty. I've taken the decision to lift the three week old restriction on movements in the greater Accra metropolitan area and Kaswa and the greater Kumasi metropolitan area and its contiguous districts. With effect from 1 a.m. on Monday, 20th April. In effect, tomorrow, we'll see the partial lockdown in Accra and Kumasi being lifted. I must make it clear at the outset that lifting these restrictions does not mean we're letting our guard down. All other measures are still firmly in place for the avoidance of doubt. The earlier measures announced on Wednesday, 15th March, which have been extended, are still very much in force and have not been relaxed. I'm demanding even greater adherence to these measures. In here, I'm referring to the suspension of all public gatherings, including conferences, workshops, funerals, parties, nightclubs, drinking spots, beaches, festivals, political rallies, religious activities, and sporting events. All educational facilities, private and public, are to remain closed. Businesses and other workplaces can continue to operate, observing staff management and workplace protocols with a view to achieving social distancing and hygiene protocols. Well, so that's the caveat, observing hygiene and social distancing protocols. That's the president speaking yesterday. And then earlier, you also heard him giving some detail as to uh, the economic you know, considerations in taking the decision to lift the lockdown. We're going to get into that. But my colleague Miriam Oseyajiman was at the Aboso Kind Spare Parts Hub today just to gauge the mood as to whether, you know, businesses are responding to the whole lockdown on day one. Just take a look. It's a day after the president called off the lockdown in Accra, Greater Kumasi and Kaswa that lasted three weeks. I'm at Aboso Kind and I'm here to find out how business is today the first day after the lockdown as you can see behind me many of the traders are back doing brisk business fin will be acting into fin a customer so na pepe o mun se o meba ma ko ma ko into in fin say na me adu me fi o chine ko no de o mbe tumi ay den aba ne na obi e kwa ma ye into ye ba akrom e be hwe say de akrom sitie into hwa aha no ma ye din ini pa no majority na ma akrom since morning, I've experienced that the market is going on well because most people was trying to come and buy something because of the lockdown. They were not able to come. So for the first day, I can see the attendance is very fast and people are coming to buy things because of the, because of the lockdown that delay everything. Because for market today, I can say glory be to God, so good. People are coming. I'm still interacting with some of the traders here at Abusu Okai. It's quite evident that the safety protocols are not being adhered to. Now you're the busy one, but a ban is on. You can feel it. You're not moving the offer. You're just here. It's a fiance now. It's a fiance now. Yaba. It's. And I say even if we ban our own runners, I say I new team. We are running sad that our people need care more. Oh, I say we guide that. And I say the ordinary nose mask need be added. I cover now. No, I wear but. For the customers, no, I have I have more sanitizers. I was even having the bucket, but because of the lockdown, no, I take it home. 
So from tomorrow or maybe two days, I'll buy another one and keep it here. I was using some here because because today is the only the first time you have come to the market. By tomorrow or the next day, no, definitely no. I'll buy another one. You see how the minutes will be our things. Say the man say customer and boss. Me man I have said me mean the minutes are there no even. So no mumu. I'm born and I'm buying say there because me much man I'm here no. As a second, be a man saw or you mean me say me or she means saw you know. I'm born me. That's the Abose Okai spare parts hub. I mean, it's the first day business is expected to pick up, you know, all things being the call. I'm going to go for this quick break. When I come back, I'll be joined via Skype by the Chief Executive Officer of the Private Enterprise Federation, Nano Sebonso, as well as the Director of the Institute for Statistical Social and Economic Research is at the University of Ghana, Legon, Professor Peter Corte, as well as we discuss... This 600 million cities uh, soft loan uh, package that the president spoke about yesterday, the disbursement is supposed to start in May. What, what criteria are we using? Guta has raised some concerns about that. We'll hear from them as well. And then also look at the implications of the lifting of this uh, lockdown. We'll be joined as well uh, later on by Dr. Bamfo from Nigeria. He's a senior partner as well and a former uh, director with KPMG Nigeria. He'll be joining us via Skype from Nigeria as well as Professor John Gachi, who is the dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School. Stay with us. There's a lot coming up. You're welcome back to Business Focus here on TV3. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I've been joined on Skype by uh, Professor Peter Corte, who's the director of the Institute for Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ISA. Uh, Prof, good evening to you. Thank you for joining us. Good evening and good evening to your viewers. Let me also welcome Nano Bonsu, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Private Enterprise Federation. Nana, it's good to have you. Good evening to you. Good evening, sir, and good evening to your viewers as well. Fantastic. Gentlemen, before um, I have you, your take on, on this 600 million uh, cities uh, soft loan the president spoke about which is supposed to start uh, the disbursement is supposed to start in May let's take a listen to the president talk about this particular package this uh, interventions for small businesses the effects of the measures to contain the virus have been difficult for many and that is why I mandated the creation of the 1.2 billion CD coronavirus alleviation pro program to support households and businesses. Out of this amount, 280 million CDs is being used to provide food for the vulnerable and free water for all Ghanaians for three months, i.e. April, May, and June. 323 million f CDs is being used to motivate our health workers. And 600 million CDs of assistance is being provided to micro, small, and medium-scale businesses. I expect disbursements of the 600 million CDs to start in May. Government is fully absorbing electricity bills for one million active lifeline customers and is granting a 50% subsidy on electricity bills of all other customers using their March 2020 bill as their benchmark for the months of April, May, and June. In total, the relief on electricity will amount to some 1 billion CD. Well, so that's the president there. Now, uh, let me start off with you, um, Professor Peter Corte. First off, how do you react to the decision to lift the lockdown and uh, the explanation that's been coming from the president that a lot of it in terms of the considerations was economic. Well, I, I think the, the president had more information than uh, you and I. So um, I believe he took the best decision in our interest, given the set of information available to him. Um, but yes, economic uh, issues mattered a lot in this. 
now you have two groups of people. One group that um, is more afraid of the virus, uh, I would say is self-sufficient for now. Um, in the next few, uh, for a couple of weeks or months, it's, it's okay and it's more concerned about the virus. Then you have another set of people who are more afraid of hunger and starvation and uh, would have the impression that uh, they will be killed by hunger before the virus gets to them. So you would see um, each of these in um, one way or the other. Uh, but, but then you would, you would also find that uh, you cannot lock down, particularly in our part of the world, Unlike the U.S., U.K., people um, are very much informed, where they very much respect directives. In our case, you have quite a number of people who are also very ignorant and might not really appreciate the nature of the pandemic. So you find people not respecting social distance and, and all sort of things. Um, having said all of this, I think there is a limit to which you can lock down uh, in Africa, especially, you can't transplant what works in Europe into Africa because we have a large informal sector, informal sector that accounts for over 80 percent of our economy, mm -hmm. and they have quite a people who basically leave hand to mouth. So if you lock down such people for a very long time, there is going to be upheavals, there is going to be uprising. Uh, if you are not careful, there will be a clash between them and the security forces. If you are not careful. People will start looting shops and the like. So, um, as a leader or president, you need to factor all of this into your 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 decision making. And I believe uh, this called for, apart from the, the what data the, the the medical people advise, I think the economic factors and some of the social ramifications were considered. So, and also, also uh, let me seek your initial thoughts on this. Do you think that? Um I mean, f as we speak, businesses really do have the confidence to step out uh, and actually open up their shops, do business in, in the midst of the, 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 the virus spreading. And that is, that is the part that I said this morning. As much as you have the freedom to move, you really want to go because you don't have the confidence thinking that the guy I meet on the street is not infested with the virus. And Peter just gave the social ramifications that people are hungry, they need to go out and get food, they need to do all the other things. But once it's open, if anybody had gone out today, surprisingly, the majority of the people stayed indoors. True. Shops are so closed. Because the confidence that we haven't tested enough and the virus has not been contained is scaring everybody from coming out. Businesses want to do business, yes, indeed, but they don't want to die. And so unless we do the testing, and that is, to me, the critical game changer, if we have enough equipment to do the th testing to see a majority of our people are virus-free, then it gives the people the opportunity that, okay, only a minor, so if I take good care of myself, I'm not going to be infested with it. I said my employees are coming to work. They're traveling from home, mingling with various people. They have no clue what they're doing and not doing. And they get to the office, scared to their wits. Can they perform? Not really. They're going to be body present, but mind absent. So we have to look and balance this off with the opportunity that, yes, the, as Peter indicated, we cannot lock down the economy forever. But we have to take prudent measures and get the equipment needed. How do we get the equipment when the government itself is struggling with funding? Let's partner with private sector, incentivize people with the resources to bring up front the money that we need, buy the equipment, do the testing. Testing is critical. And, and the antibodies or whatever type of testing, let's do that. That will give people the confidence that, okay, 60% of our people are virus free. So now we can go and jump on the streets and do whatever. Unless we do that, the stores are going to be closed because they want to do business. They want the economic returns, but they want the economic returns while they are living, not when they're going to find, you know, the demise of that uh, virus. Mm. So those are issues that, yes, opening up is fantastic, allowing everybody. But if you open up the person who doesn't even want to come out, as I said today, if you go out, majority of the people didn't come out. True. And, and so what that means is, uh, Professor Peter Cotter, I'm going to come to you. Like, 
people are on what I would term a voluntary lockdown. I mean, yes, lockdown has been lifted, but if you look at the streets of Accra, still, you know, virtually empty. Businesses haven't opened, and that's what Nano Sebons was making the point that, yes, people want to make money, but they don't want to die. And so at what point would we, I mean, or would businesses have the confidence to respond to what the president had in mind for lifting this lockdown? I think um, confidence takes quite some time. Um, Nana is very much right. As soon as you, you open up, you will not find many people jumping on the streets. And especially uh, the business sector. Those are the category I'll term the self-sufficient for now. Um, they have a bit of resources, they have a bit of savings. And for them, their health is very critical, very key to them. Unlike those you find at the night market, unlike those you find at the beach, despite the, the pandemic. You know. So uh, back to my point, confidence takes time to rebuild. So you will not find people the very day the, the ban is lifted. So gradually, the people gradually find that, yes, I am safe. Then the businesses will gradually start to operate. But, but I think, uh, in all, we need to be protective. We need to protect ourselves, apart from the testing. And I, mean, I mean, testing is very key. We need to test. But we also have to be protecting ourselves. Uh, uh, I think the president advised we wear the nose mask. We apply all the um, protocol, the health protocols, as much as possible, social distancing. Uh, we should practice as much as possible and um, gradually um, start to operate. Um, hopefully, confidence will, 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 will bounce back or will, will, will rebound. But at the moment, it's too early. It's early days yet to think that um, people will have the confidence to quickly jump on the street. Yes, in some transport terminals, you saw people moving. And, uh, we had uh, the transport terminals today. There are a lot of people traveled uh, in country. Yeah, and some business would also certainly operate. If you have a cement uh, a warehouse or, or shop, um, after the three weeks lockdown, it will be in your interest to open up and, and try to sell some. Otherwise, your stock will go. Similarly, if, if, I mean, there could be other uh, forms of businesses where people will have to risk. So um, I'm sure as confidence comes back, uh, people behave responsibly. Mm. Businesses. But, uh, um, but, but Prof, you, you know, confidence is, is predicated on what Nana was talking about earlier. The, the assurance that we have tested enough, we know exactly, you know, what the picture really looks like with respect to this virus's behavior because the virus is, has a mind of, of its own. It, 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 it does what it likes. So... At what point would you say, and this will go to the two of you, that indeed there is a show of confidence so that then businesses will jump on it? Because you talked about the fact that confidence takes time to, to build. Is there enough goodwill around this time for businesses to actually step out? Now, now let me start with you. What? Okay. 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 Let businesses will step out because it's their investment. They don't want to lose their investment. And once you lock up, you lock down, some of these markets are being looted left and right. But as you said, at what time is confidence going to be built? When we have tested enough. Now we have two forms of testing, testing for the virus and then testing for antibodies. So, but the, as I said earlier, the government doesn't have the resources to get all these equipment. How do we get that done? This is a conversation we have to have with government to make sure that the deep pocketed private sector businesses or the top players, the chambers of mine, telco chambers and others with the resources can be approached and incentivized to bring out and buy the equipment on behalf of government, maybe with tax exemptions at the end of the tunnel. So this way, it will allow us to speed up the testing me me mechanism uh, at least so we can move them. Because as you said correctly, we cannot have a lockdown forever. And it's about time that we find the resources to do the testing that will build the confidence in the people to make sure that, oh, okay, we're not comfortable. Because practicing safety nets and others and covering your nose and your mouth is one of the measures. If Ghanaians decide to do that 
and then make sure that we all uh, uh, improve in our health in a way that we, the infection goes down, the rate of infection goes down. It also builds confidence, even without the testing. But when there's no social uh, distancing, social distancing is not an easy for Ghanaian because our cultural dictates and practices do not allow these kind of social distancing. So we have to be pragmatic to make sure that we know what we're doing and it's acceptable to Ghanaians. Acceptability is the testing. Acceptability is covering your nose. And, and the point that I raised this morning is when the president encouraged people to wear masks in the, in the public, I didn't know whether he had the authority or he didn't, didn't have to make it mandatory that if you step up in certain jurisdictions, you step up without covering your nose and mouth, you should be, be arrested. I think with that kind of authority, uh, people would conform to the, the right things to do. We all need to build our self-confidence. Our self-confidence is protecting me to protect you. So you mm -hmm. protecting me to protect, protecting yourself to protect me makes a dual understanding and responsibility on the part of business. Because once business sees this, because you don't want to be a vendor standing there and somebody without a nose cover coming to buy tomatoes or onions from you and coming to breathe hard on you. You'd be scared to death. So the area of having the confidence both sides of the aisle from the people who are going to purchase and the key vendors who are selling is basically when they have the understanding that enough has been done and I'm comfortable to go down on the street. Prof, let me have your take on this, please. Yes, um... On a lighter note, um, during my graduate school days, um, during the days of SARS, the Asians were wearing nose masks. So for them, they are, it's, it's not new to them. But for us, it is new in our culture. So it's not just uh, handshakes and <laughs> But wearing the mask itself uh, is new to us uh, um, and it's not very comfortable. But, but having said, I think you're very much right. We need to put it on. I wish the president has legislated that is. It's mandatory. We all put it on so that we protect each other. Now that uh, we are free to move about, it's very critical. I see. You know, but one thing I haven't um, uh, got in my head around is, is the statistics, the testing statistics, the, the number of cases we turn out. Um, well, we are told there's a backlog, so they're trying to clear. But ideally, if you look at UK, US, and many countries, they'll tell you today we have 1,000 new infections. We have 1,000 or 500 deaths today. I would want us to reach a stage where we can say that we have each, each day and report the number of new cases, the mm. number of deaths. You know, then you can say, look, the uh, curve is, is declining or, or, you know, reach the peak or, you know, that, that would build confidence. Right. At the moment, sometimes two, three days, then we have some huge statistics, then, then we wait, then we come with some numbers. That is not easy for me as uh, 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 an analyst to follow the trend and say, look, these are the new, daily new infections, mm. and therefore it is now or it True. is going up. And therefore I say that, yes, we have reached the stage, we have tested enough, we have also reached the stage where new infections are going down, and therefore I have the confidence that we are, we are on track. I think once we clear the backlog, and then also back to the point that I raised, if we get all the testing uh, equipment, we should be given daily infection rates. Right. That, that for me. Is I, I think it's a great point. Let, that let me come in make. here a little bit. Let me, yeah. let me capture, come in here. The let, data let capture in our system, Peter, you and I go a long ways back about accuracy of data and data collection. That is yeah. not an easy thing in our environment. So mm. we get data almost like uh, going to the dentist. Uh, are they accurate, number one? Is it flowing? Is that a lag of two days or one week or what? So the data capture is critical. As you said, once we have the live data as of this morning, as of this evening, it gives confidence as to whether the curve is now flattening or whether the curve is rising or True. what. It allows people. You see, what we're talking about here is any mechanism that will allow people's confidence to come back that they can go out and do what they need to do. I agree with you perfectly on that. And what, we don't know whether there's a model that will let us know whether the curve is flattening or, you know, declining whatsoever. But I, I want to just take two minutes to round up 
What are you expecting in terms of the criteria or considerations that the president should look out for in disbursing this 600 million CD uh, soft loan package that he talked about for the small and medium scale enterprise? Let me start off with you, Nana, on this, and then, Prof, you conclude for me, please. Well, the, I said that in the morning. It's not just a short-term uh, idea. It's something to boost the recovery from the start. And you have to look at whether it's the continuity or sustainability angle to it. How does that impact on other businesses? You have to look at the value chain. Somebody may be one off. Maybe uh, they have an impact in the community. But if you look at the small and other uh, players on the ground, they have more continuity, they have more lease, and that would resurrect other parts or recover other parts of the economy. So the criteria is, is it sustainable for that business, one? Is it impactful for that community or that uh, the economy? Is it going to create jobs? Is it going to create wealth? Is it catalytic enough that it can be able to get other people to do other things that we need to do? Let's not look at it as a one shot. And as I said, if this 600, if we had sat down to analyze, I would have advised government, can we use that as a co-funding to get some of the private sector to match the fund that government is bringing to the table so we have a matching fund or collateralized funding that would uh, you know, expand that 600 million to maybe 1.2 billion. Mm. There are ways of doing that, but at least this is where we are now. It's not too late. The avenues of disbursement got to be transparent, it got to be accountable, it got to be looking for one word, impactful. That is what I think should be done. Great. Thank you. Prof? Yes, um, just, just to add to what Nana said, um, this is money that I certainly have to be repaid. Um, although they are soft loans, they have to be repaid. And therefore, you will not, we have to look at a viable business. Um, we, we have modules for assessing credit, for credit appraisal. So certainly you might want to look at that and ensure that these are viable businesses. There are some businesses, if you inject money, they might not be viable, particularly in these times uh, that, that we live in. And you have to look at all of this and ensure that that process is sustainable. You can, uh, the payment and that money can plow back into other businesses to ensure sustainability. I, I also think that the sector itself that is is very critical. Uh, if it is the impulse of speaking industry, um, for instance, report if it's, it's rice, for instance, or the commodities that we, we tend to import. At the moment, it's quite difficult to even import them. So if we, we are investing in businesses that are producing local markets that have high value added, that, that also is the value chain. I think process that is the way to go. So in my view, it's, it's critical. But one last point, I think this process very speed. Um, this is we are in a situation where you don't have to wait for too long, right? The usual credit appraisal or mm. process where it takes twelve six to twelve months or sometimes two years would be best. I expect that within the next month or two. The decision should be taken on some of these applications and be disbursed so that companies can quickly revive their businesses and, and help produce to revive the, the economy. It should be right. done in a very transparent manner. Um, Non-partisan. Don't, we don't want to see situations where if you bear a party card, you benefit. If you don't support a particular party, uh, uh, um, you don't benefit. It has to be as transparent as possible and it should go to viable businesses. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Extremely grateful for this very progressive conversation that we've been having. Thank you, Nanose Bonsu, uh, Chief Executive Officer Thank of the Private much, Enterprise sir. Federation. Thank be. you as well, uh, Professor Peter Kote. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Uh, Director of the Institute for Statistical, Social and Economic Research is at the University of Ghana, Lagon. And the uptake is this whole disbursement process must be impartial impactful, transparent, must be viable. And that's what the Ghana Union of Trade Association Guta has been talking about. Be back shortly and then we'll have the second half of the conversation. Do stay.
Welcome back to Business Focus here on TV3. I've been joined on Skype again by a, a next set of guests for the next half of discussion. Uh, Dr. Joshua Bamfo is uh, the partner and head of transfer pricing services practice at Anderson Tax in Nigeria. And also until recently, he was the associate director at KPMG Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Bamfo, thank you for joining us from Nigeria. Good evening to you. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Great. Let me also welcome Hi. Professor John Gachi, who John. is the Dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School. Prof, good evening to you. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Great. Let me start off with you, uh, uh, Professor um, Gachi. First off, you First listened off. to the President yesterday, and he has been explaining the reasons underlining the decision to lift the lockdown. Uh, you think that they are economically viable enough uh, to want to go on this path, or businesses might also have their own reservations? Well, I think the issue is not about economic viability. It is about a combination of uh, the balance between the health requirement as put forward by the experts and the economic reality. So you cannot look at the economic reality only, but you should balance it between what the experts have told you in terms of the pandemic that we are dealing with. Uh, if you look at some economies that are dealing with the pandemic, they are able to tell you on daily basis uh, what is the situation regarding the death rate, what is the situation regarding those who have recovered, and what is the situation regarding the daily confirmation of new cases. And as a result of that, they are able to plot some graph and they are able to determine that they have gotten to what they call the peak and they are descending the curve. And for that matter, that informed them that they may uh, have to go into some kind of restriction to allow economic activity to, to begin. Uh, if you watch the president yesterday, the only basis for which the restriction were actually uh, um, uh, uh, removed uh, was because of the. Yeah, he, he made the them. point. And that is not informative enough, and that will not actually promote the kind of confidence that people need to go around their work. And that is the reason why you will see only shops opening gradually because that kind of confidence is not injected into uh, the system because of the background leading to uh, the announcement of the lifting of the uh, lockdown. Well, Dr. Bampo, you, you, in your Facebook post, you, you did some analysis justifying this particular decision by the president. You want to share with us? Yeah, um, I think it's very clear to us that... Um, and World Health Organization has even um, stressed upon it. And every region will have their own peculiarities in terms of the impact of the virus. So if you take Africa as a sub-region, you know, our data and what the data is telling us is completely different from what you see in Western Europe, United States, or even Southeastern Asia. So clearly, we have our own peculiarities that we need to take into consideration when making informed decisions. What was very informative for us was that um, the president came out clearly with five key objectives that, you know, the measures were supposed to achieve. The first three objectives had to do with controlling the spread of the COVID-19 disease. And that's very telling. It basically buttresses his point that the most important thing is to save lives. So clearly, in terms of importance and urgency, you know, the necessary condition is to save lives, which means that we need to contain the spread of the disease. Then the um, objectives four and five basically looks at the economic implications, which basically buttresses the fact that whenever you um, implement restrictive contain containment measures, there are going to be adverse economic implications. So you need to also balance those um, adverse um, economic implications. So it's a balance of two evils, you know, making sure that you kept the spread, which is the public health aspect of it, mm -hmm. you know, saving lives. And at the same time, making sure that the containment measures do not have significant adverse impact on the economy, which means you need to have some fiscal stimulus packages or monetary policy stimulus right. to actually cushion the economy. So it's that balance. 
Now, how did the um, president come to this decision? Right from um, before the lockdown took um, effect, he clearly informed you know, the public about the need for us to collate some data in order to make informed decisions as to whether to extend it or to lift it. Now, what it's um, instructive that we need to be clear about is that the containment measures is not only about a partial lockdown. There are three major containment measures. The first had to do with the first objective, making sure that we don't continue to import COVID into Ghana, mm -hmm. which is the ban of international flights and yeah. making sure that we protect our borders. Yes, that but I, I just want to make measure. the point, Dr. Mabo, I just want to okay. make the point but that the current figure of 1,042, 80% mm -hmm. of it was, with, in fact, is with people who do not have any travel history. That's according to the Ghana Health Service. Uh, mm -hmm. on the data on their website. Data on their website. So, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying this because of the tangents that you're taking. Yeah, so that's a fair point. Remember, you know, the, this whole COVID-19 is an imported disease. So clearly the initial challenge is that it, it was imported, then it has a domestic spread. So the first measure was to contain importation of the COVID-19, um, you know, disease. The second measure is how to control the domestic spread of that disease. And that's where, you know, personal hygiene protocols were actually um, implemented, organizations um, also came in. Secondly, there was a social um, distancing policies, such as banning large social gatherings. Which is still in, in place. You don't have um, schools, um, um, you know. Yeah, in I, I get the point. Yeah. So and I just wanted to ask. Now the tech and yep. yep. Yeah, I just wanted to find out that the, the the focus is on the economic, which you were coming to. So indeed, okay. wh where do we go from here quickly, and then I'll come to Professor. All Alberti. right. So on the economic side, all right. Let me just go straight to that. So on the economic side, it has to do with the recognition that we are just lifting an aspect of the containment measures which has to do with, you know, the partial lockdown of the two epicenters, Kumasi and Accra, which both happens to be our largest commercial centers in Ghana, right? Now, if you do lift that, all right, and assuming that the data that they use to make that scientific, you know, um, decision, you know, is reliable and it actually works out, what, it happen what happens then is that the informal sector, which is hardest hit by this particular measure, all right, will start gradually you know, coming back into business. As right. uh, Prof Riley said, it's not going to be an immediate impact. People might not be confident. You okay. know, there's always going to be the anxiety and the fear. Exactly. But it's that point. gradual, you know, um, transition into normalcy that is important for most economies. Prof Gaji, you, you see that gradual transition? You want to sh do you share in that same analysis, finally? Well, well, definitely people are actually calling for the easing of the... Uh, the lockdown, so that they can go back to to work and then end their their living. So as uh, they see people moving around, especially uh, observing the protocols, uh, they will they will join gradually. Uh, but I think uh, the point to note is that the lockdown is not necessitated by the importation of the disease. The lockdown is necessitated by how the disease is spreading domestically. And that has been enhanced right now. Therefore, if you are putting for uh, some data, that data process must be transparent so that other like-minded people yeah. can follow through. Yeah. But as it is now, we are not following through. Right. We are only being told. And that is why the problem is. And when that is done, uh, you will see that uh, right. it will just be a normal process of beginning economic right. activity. And that should be taken seriously. Great. Prof, I want to thank you so much for this recommendation and then also to you, Dr. Joshua Bampo, extremely grateful for this forward-moving conversation. It's, it's a progressive one indeed, and we're not ending now. We've got to continue uh, subsequently. But I want to say thank you to you, Dr. Joshua Bampo, Partner and Head Transfer Pricing Group, and then also, until recently, Associate Director at KPMG Nigeria. Also, Professor John Gatti, uh, the Dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School, joining us via Skype as well. And to you out there, thank Thank you for doing the watching. My name is Alfred Kansi and this has been Business for Good.